Perfect. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Othan Alexandrakis. I'm an associate professor and chair of the Department of Anthropology. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our department's annual lecture. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to invite the president of our department's undergraduate student association, Maria Capletti, to read the land acknowledgement, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. So I'm going to read the you know, University Land Acknowledgement, but I want everyone to know that since we are in institutional Zoom, we're going to be in different lands, so do your own little land acknowledgement as well. So your University recognizes that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which your University campuses are located that precede the establishment of your University. Your University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been taken care of by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Hurunwenda. It is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders that the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Ditch of One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. Thank you so much. I'll put a link in the chat for nativeslands.ca so you can see exactly which indigenous territory you're on right now. That's great. Thank you, Maria. As part of our commitment to decolonization, the Department of Anthropology has committed to engaging with and supporting the work of indigenous scholars, activists, artists, land defenders, and water keepers to remaining accountable to the ways that colonialism and white supremacy continue to inform institutions of higher learning and the privileging of colonial ways of knowing and to unsettling how the discipline of anthropology continues to benefit from extractive forms of knowledge that maintain colonial forms of power. Among our various decolonizing initiatives, colleagues at the department have established two major awards in support of Indigenous and Black students. You can learn more about these awards and you may make a donation by following the link in the chat, which I'm adding now. The annual lecture is a marquee event of the Department of Anthropology. Past speakers have included eminent leaders in the field, including Anna Singh, Elizabeth Pavanelli, Hugh Raffles, Karen Ho, Audra Simpson, and Ann Stoller. With the support of York's Founders College, the Center for Refugee Studies, and the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, we continue this tradition today. Once again, welcome everyone to the annual lecture. I would now like to invite the Dean of our faculty, JJ McMurtry, to say a few words before turning it over to my colleague, Professor David Murray, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and thank you, Maria, for the land acknowledgement. And good uh, afternoon, everybody. I really am thrilled to be with you all today. It's an exciting event, and it's so wonderful to see so many people, almost 100 participants uh, here. It's really great during a during a pandemic that we can get this many people out. So on behalf of the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, I want to welcome Professor Jason de Leon to York University, if only virtually. I'm so pleased that you're with us today, Dr. Leon. These are uh, incredibly important events for the university and for the faculty. The ideas that get exchanged, the, uh, the knowledge and information sharing with uh, international colleagues as well as national colleagues helps us to grow and nurture and nourish new research. So it's really critical that we're having these events and, and thank you again uh, for being with us because as COVID uh, has taught us, these events can be fleeting and so many opportunities have been lost over the last number of years for all of us to exchange ideas. So it's great to see us all gathering here today and, uh, and in great numbers to uh, experience these types of events again. I, on a personal note, I'm just uh, booked to go to my first conference in almost three years, and I'm so excited to be with colleagues again in the spring. So about this event, York is really fortunate to have such a diverse and vibrant uh, anthropology program. This annual lecture has been mentioned as a marquee event for students, staff, faculty, and the community as a whole. And many thanks go out to all the organizers who continue to bring thoughtful and timely talks to the university. And during a pandemic, again, I hate to mention it all the time, but really it's extra labor, it's volunteer labor, and it's, it's really important. So thank you so much for putting that effort in. So today's lecture, I think, is really very timely uh, because we are all witnessing, of course, a new refugee crisis as well as the existing ones that haunt us uh, already. 
Tens of thousands of Ukrainians, if not millions, are leaving Ukraine to flee the country. And we're seeing attention to these types of topics uh, being broadcast around the world and being discussed uh, in various areas. So today's discussion about migration, border enforcement, and the subsequent violence endured by migrants is critical. And these conversations, of course, give us a front row seat into leading discussions right here in the Department of Anthropology of real world problems and investigations into those problems. And I'm sure what's discussed today will lead to ongoing and complex discussions for many weeks to come, months hopefully, uh, in the department, uh, amongst colleagues and amongst uh, the community. So thank you again, everybody, so much for attending today. I really look forward to seeing part of it. I apologize I have to leave in a little bit, but I really uh, look forward to this talk and thank you all for attending. So I'll turn it over to David now. Thanks. Thank you, Dean McMurtry. Thank you, Austin and Maria. Um, <clears throat> welcome, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our speaker. And uh, Professor Jason De Leon is a professor of anthropology and Chicana, Chicano, and Central American Studies at UCLA. He is also executive director of the Undocumented Migration Project, a research arts education collective that seeks to document and raise awareness about the experiences of clandestine migrants. And he is president of the board of directors for the Calibri Center for Human Rights a nonprofit organization that seeks to identify and repatriate the remains of people who have died while migrating through the Sonoran Desert of Arizona. Professor De Leon is the author of the award-winning book, The Land of Open Graves, Living and Dying on the Migrant Trail, and is a 2017 MacArthur Fellow. He is currently working on a book project called Soldiers and Kings, an ethnography of the lives of Honduran smugglers crossing Mexico. And just before I turn it over to Professor De Leon, um, just uh, to remind everyone, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the talk today. Um, that's being organized through the Q&A uh, window feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can post a question through Q&A. Because it's a really large group, um, we've uh, decided that that's the best way to make sure we see all the questions rather than trying to navigate with people putting their hands up. So just post your question. We will try to get through as many as we can before 6 p.m. And I'll moderate that after and I'll read the questions to uh, Dr. De, De Leon. So without further ado, over to you, Dr. De Leon. Thank you so much for having me. And it feels like every time I do one of these things, I, I, I sat in a Zoom talk maybe two months ago and the person said, I'm going to share my Zoom screen now, but I'm not going to say I'm going to share my Zoom screen. Um, and so I've been working on trying to share my Zoom screen without actually falling into that trap. Um, but uh, it didn't work again, but that's totally fine. Um, I'm just really excited to be here. I'm, I'm sorry that um, that I couldn't be there um, in, in person. Let me just make sure that you are seeing correctly everything that you should be seeing, except not that. Okay, does that look good? Okay, um, you know, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I'm I'm sad that I can't be there in person, but it's it's really just great to have, um, you know, this this cross border dialogue about these issues. Um, you know, as someone who was at the University of Michigan for many, many years um, and thinking a lot about border issues between Canada and the United States and the similarities and differences with what's happening along the U.S.-Mexico border, it's just always, um, I think, imp important to, to to have these types of conversations, um, you know, and especially right now, as, um, as Dean McMurtry mentioned, you know, we're in, a, uh, we're in a moment right now where a refugee crisis that's happening in Europe is incredibly visible. And yet at the same time, there are these other refugee crises that have been happening for a very long time time that come in and out of of um, of, of public view uh, in, including what's going on in, um, in 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 Central America and and I and I bring this up because you know there was a New York Times article last week about this spike since since June of this uh, of last year of Russians and Ukrainians crossing the US Mexico border and asking for asylum um, the statistic was something like uh, two thirds of those asylum cases have been approved. It's it's you know it's a relatively small number compared to people coming from Latin America, but most people from Latin America who apply for asylum um, 
number one, are forced to wait in Mexico while their cases are being heard. The United States has been letting in Ukrainians and Russians while they await those asylum um, hearings, and then has also been approving two thirds of those cases. And so, you know, despite the fact that we've got multiple um, refugee crises happening right now, there's very much this lens, I think, of of race uh, and discrimination and other things that, that are impacting sort of who qualifies as um, as an acceptable refugee and and who doesn't. I mean, and obviously this is not not meant to um, uh, you know to to say anything bad about what's happening in, in Ukraine, um, you know, of course, I think everybody's really feeling for 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 folks there, especially the civilian casualties. Um, but I just think it, it it could also be an important moment for us to begin to look around and say, well, who are these other refugees globally that we need to be, um, you know, treating with, with with care and with dignity and trying to, you know, um, as as, as first world nations trying to to help alleviate the, the suffering that they are um, they are experiencing. Uh, that also being said, I think that the United States has done an incredibly poor job of um, assisting refugees and migrants, especially in the wake of a recent um, presidential um, shift from away from the Trump administration towards towards Biden's administration, where um, you know many Americans were promised a, a new and more and kinder, more gentler kind of American immigration system, and yet. Uh, much like the Who song, you know, meet the meet the new boss, same as the old, um, where many of the things that we were promised were going to change have continued to stay the same. And I think for me, part of it is um, oftentimes just the general tone deafness that the, that the American public and the, especially the American government has about immigration issues. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris last year went to Central America for her first visit there in that um, as, as vice president. And one of the things that she said to a room full of reporters in Guatemala was, do not come to the United States. And at, soon after that press conference, I was asked by uh, a, a reporter from, I think, from England who said, well, you know, what do you think about what this what the vice president said? And my response was, if that worked, we would have said that a long time ago. Right. But it's just we're, we're just putting these kind of these shallow statements out into the world about immigration um, and about the way that things are and, and how we think we can solve these problems. And I think it's just really problematic. And I think it's it's also indicative of a much longer history of of um, American historical amnesia, um, as well as just a, a refusal to understand or to acknowledge that that things are bad in um, you know, in, in a lot of these places. And when we tell people to not come from, you know, uh, to not leave Central America and come to the United States, I think what a lot of folks don't understand too is that those countries are becoming increasingly unlivable, much like many other parts of the world. Um, and these things are linked to, to climate change. Um, there's an, inc an increasingly direct correlation between the impacts of climate change and the creation of refugees. And so we can look just to Honduras in, in the last 16 months to see how, you know, back-to-back -back super hurricanes have devastated that country and made it um, unlivable for so many who have, you know, who have had to flee um, because there are no jobs, because their homes have been destroyed, uh, because their economy has been shut, shut down by COVID, uh, but also because they're living you know, in, in, in some of the most violent countries in uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And so when we tell people, you know, don't come to the United States, stay where you are, people in places like Honduras and El Salvador um, are living within, with unbelievably high um, homicide rates that, you know, people will say to you, I would rather die in the Sonora Desert of Arizona than be shot on a street corner in San Pedro Sula by a stranger, because at least in the in the Sonora Desert, I've taken my own, my own life into my into my own hands, and there's also the the potential of of of, of improving my my situation. Um, so I think we just need to be thinking more about the connection between you know this migration crisis political instability poverty and now increasingly things like like warfare as the as helping to fuel this growing global migration crisis that, this, that the next generation is really going to have to deal with um in much better ways than than my generation and, and those previously ha um, um have, have done so i, I want to just kind of um you know i wanted to, to set that up um as a, just a kind of a, a a precursor to what we're going to talk about um in arizona um so we can kind of bring that into the, um, I think, into the into the Q and A, uh, and. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today comes from my first book project, The Land of Open Graves, which is largely about um, what's going on in the Arizona desert. I've just completed a book, um, as was mentioned, um, on Honduran smugglers, and so looking at how human smuggling has evolved post 2015, um, and what that looks like in relationship to transnational gangs, climate change, um, and a whole host of other things. So I'm happy to connect the dots um, in, in the Q and A as well. But I think it's important, you know, today to really understand what's happening 
along the U.S.-Mexico border, um, because it is the most sort of, you know, famous border in the Western Hemisphere, if not in the in the world. It's a border where um, many other countries are taking cues from in terms of how to to manage um, uh, immigration security, you know, for good or for bad, and I would argue for, for bad. Um, so I think it's important for us to understand that history because it does extend, and I will talk about how it extends into Mexico and elsewhere um, throughout this talk. But we're going to we're going to get a little bit of a history lesson about this policy called prevention through deterrence. I'm going to talk about um, the violence that migrants experience um, and, and the fatalities that, that are happening on a, on a daily basis. And I'll do that by by telling some stories about individuals who have unfortunately lost their lives along the border. And if you can take away any anything from this talk, it's number one. You know, I'm, uh, the, America has been talking about border walls for the last five or six years. Um, more so than 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 they have in a really long time, and the, what I want to argue is that you know border walls are smoke screens, and the desert that we have in places like southern Arizona are in fact a, a, a giant border that border wall that's been existing and brutalizing people for a very long time. I also want to argue that the deaths that happen along that geopolitical boundary are not collateral damage; it's not unintended consequences, but these are the direct results of policies designed to kill people. And then finally, I want to make this argument that. Um, the violence that happens at the U.S.-Mexico border extends far beyond that. It extends into Latin America, it extends into 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 um, uh, into the United States, and and much farther. And the things that happen there really um, are are long lasting and part of a much larger, I think, um, global problem around around border security. And so, just as a warning, there will be a couple of images. Um, around migrant death that might be um, a bit troubling, but I think it's important to to look at these things head on um, and to, you know, to try to not whitewash the, the realities that people are, um, are experiencing on a daily basis. The work that I'm gonna talk about today comes from the Undocumented Migration Project, which is a research arts and education collective that I've directed since 2009. Um, it's basically, uh, it's a whole bunch of different research approaches that I've that I've stolen either from within my own discipline of anthropology or co-opted from others, um, and tried to combine in different sorts of ways in in an attempt to better understand what's happening um, um, along the migrant trail. Uh, and this involves you know ethnography, uh, archaeology, forensic science, and you'll you'll see a little bit of this stuff today. Um, but it's also a significant amount of exhibition work um, and other various outreach um, components, including. Um, the work that we do now with uh, an organization called the Colibri Center for Human Rights, which um, is a Tucson-based nonprofit that works with families of the missing. We work to um, to take DNA collections from families so that we can match them to re recovered human remains as well as uh, missing persons reports. And we are um, the the Undocumented Migration Project is currently in the um, in the process of legally absorbing um, Colibri, and so. You know, we, we joined up in the fall, and then we're going through the, the paperwork right now um, uh, to to be legally linked. And and then, um, basically, I'll, um, I've been I've been I've been directing the Colibri Center for now for about seven months, um, uh, and then also directing the Undocumented Immigration Project. And so we're, we're hoping that by the legal merging, it'll mean one less board meeting I have to go to, um, and a whole bunch of other streamlined sorts of things. Uh, but if you're interested in learning more about our work, I would encourage you to check out our websites where you can um, you can read all about. Um, our different initiatives. And I'll talk about some of that today. Um, so th th the first thing I think is we have to understand what border crossings look like along the U.S.-Mexico border. And they, they look ra radically different from what, what they look like uh, along the, the, the U.S.-Canadian border. And I'm, and I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A as well. I spent a lot of time in, um, in Detroit and in um, Blaine, Washington, when I taught at University of Washington, working with or uh, speaking with um, U.S. Border Patrol agents who are charged with with guarding that northern border. Um, so I'm happy to talk about surveillance and 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 the different processes that go on in, in those two places. But um, but along the U.S.-Mexico border, prior to the mid 1990s, border crossings were very public kinds of affairs, where you would just really in, in broad daylight you would see hundreds of people at, at different times amassing on the Mexican side of the border, hopping the fence, and then trying to run in to 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 get past the border patrol. And typically people were fairly successful. You know, if you get a hundred people on the ground to hop the fence at once, and there's only 20 agents on the other side of the fence, a significant amount of people are gonna get through and be able to blend in with the local population, hop in a car and, and be driven off someplace else. This was going on for, for many, many years and became very politically um, unpopular, especially in the nineties, there, there was a huge 
rise in anti-immigrant sentiment that was coupled with a, a presidential election. And so when we have presidential elections in this country, the first thing that, um, that people do is attempt to demonize migrants in an attempt to better show themselves as you know political kinds of powerhouses. So this happens in the, in the early 90s and um, people start complaining about the visibility of border crossings. And so the Border Patrol decides to, to combat that that they will just put hundreds of agents on the ground and they will make it impossible to hop the fence in a place in an urban zone like San Diego or El Paso. And so suddenly people who would amass on the Mexican side of the wall and would hop the fence and get by the border patrol suddenly found that they were outnumbered and they were being caught and they were being sent immediately back to Mexico. So this, this starts to happen. People keep, keep realizing that they can't cross in, in urban zones. So what they decide to do is let's just walk or drive 20 miles east or west of this city the, the border fence drops off. There's nobody there waiting for me. I can hop the fence and then I can double back and get into the United States. That starts to happen. Um, and what the Border Patrol realizes is that they can't necessarily stop border crossings, but they can funnel them away from these urban zones and they make them less visible and they can push people out into the middle, into the middle of nowhere, um, such as the Sonora Desert as, as pictured here. And as it starts to happen, they, they, they make two kind of key realizations. Number one is that they recognize that the, we don't have a border wall along most of the southern border because of the hostile terrain, because of the, the desolate and rugged terrain. So huge mountain ranges, vast deserts, um, places that are really hard to get across and also places that are hard to maintain any kind of infrastructure. So they realize like, hey, there are natural impediments on the ground, natural um, obstacles that people could potentially you know that people would, would struggle to get past so just because you if you walk 20 miles west of um of el paso now you've got to hike through the the deserts of, of southern new mexico so they recognize okay maybe we, the, 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 this environment is um is is difficult to get across but more importantly if we funnel people away from these urban zones we can force them to walk across these these barren desolate landscapes where they can freeze to death in the winter they can die of dehydration in the summer um, where they have to walk 60 or 70 miles to get to a, a city and get picked up, that the natural environment then can suddenly become an asset to the border patrol. They can weaponize it against migrants. Um, and, you know, the idea was they would force people over, quote, more hostile terrain as a way to slow down this process. And so this is what happens in the, in the mid-90s. It becomes official in 1994 under this policy called um, prevention through deterrence. And it is the current security paradigm that exists now. But this, this paradigm now exists in places like Mexico. It exists in places like Australia. Um, we're, it, there are many places where we're trying to use the natural environment as a weapon against migrants to slow down their movement. Um, but the U.S. really kind of invented this thing, and it's been, it's been, it's been co-opted by many other governments. Um, we could think about, um, you know, folks dying in, the, um, in, northern, in the northern United States trying to get to Canada, out in the, you know, these vast, um, desolate, you know, freezing areas where people are trying to walk um, um, or, or walk from Canada into the United States, vice versa. Um, it, it's, it's been happening in both ways, but there, you know, nature is, um, is acting as an agent of the state. So we start doing this in the 90s and we block off many of these urban zones, but we leave a, a place like Southern Arizona um, relatively wide open. Um, you know, there's not a lot of border walls, there's not a lot of border security. This is a, a shot from a, a port of entry in Southern Arizona that's about three miles from the legal port of entry. Where if you walk, you know, if you walk west from that that kiosk, the wall just stops, and there's nobody there waiting to catch you. So you can li literally walk right into the United States. Um, but the problem is, you now have to walk 60 or 70, 80, 100 miles to get to Tucson or get to, to get to Phoenix. And instead of having this kind of vertical border wall, now you've got this horizontal landscape that acts as a deterrent. And so this is what prevention through deterrence is really trying to do: is to use this landscape to slow people down. We, we, we put it into place in the mid 1990s, a bunch of things start to happen um, in the US and Mexico that lead to a spike in, in out migration from Latin America, including the North American Free Trade Agreement, which really crashes the Mexican economy in the 1990s by flooding that market with US subsidies like corn that farmers couldn't sell here, but it's much cheaper to make here than in Mexico, and it outcompetes all of these um, peasant farmers. Who now suddenly they could grow corn before and take it to market. Now they can't um, because of these U.S. subsidies. So now they've got to they have to out migrate. So hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people start to leave the leave Mexico starting around 1996, 97, and they start coming through the Arizona desert. In previous years, Arizona, the entire state was averaging maybe 15 or 20 deaths along the entire U.S.-Mexico border, and suddenly now 
the numbers start to rise and you get hundreds of deaths that are happening in, in, in places like, like um, the Sonora Desert. Uh, you know, to date, actually this number is, uh, doesn't include um, the last three months, but we're now at about 3,800 recovered human remains in Arizona alone. And a lot of the forensic work that we've done um, in previous years suggests that bodies decompose so quickly in the desert that this number probably grossly underestimates the actual number of people who die. But the important, more, more important thing to think about from this graph's perspective is that fatalities are low prior to prevention through deterrence. They go into place, NAFTA happens, out migration happens, people come to the United States through the Sonora Desert of Arizona, and then suddenly a, a spike in, in migrant deaths begins to occur and stays relatively steady for, for decades. And actually in some, in some times, in some places, um, it's gotten worse. You know, in, in 2020, numbers were down for a variety of reasons, but migrant deaths were actually up. Um, it was one of the deadliest years on record for Arizona alone. Um, and so what we've seen is that um, even as migration has slowed, the, the crossing process has gotten more and more deadly as people are trying harder and harder to avoid the border patrol and they're going deeper and deeper into the into the mountains and woods to get away. Um, so there's a direct positive correlation between this policy and um, and migrant death. And when you map out migrant death in Arizona, uh, you know, for me, this is this visually represents a humanitarian crisis, you know, this horrible catastrophic loss of life that many Americans are just completely ignorant of and, you know, if this was happening anywhere else in the United States, I think people would call this a crisis. If these individuals were white individuals um, or America, white Americans, I think that this would also be considered a humanitarian crisis. Um, but because these are brown bodies, because these are undocumented individuals, um, you know, there's not a lot of attention paid to this. And a lot of my work has really tried to, to raise awareness about this issue um, through a, a variety of means writing of books and articles and other kinds of things, documentary films, um, and an increasing amount of, of exhibition work. Since 2019, I've been involved with an exhibition called Hostile Terrain 94, which is a participatory exhibition designed to raise awareness about migrant death along the US-Mexico border. Um, it's a pretty simple concept. It involves the filling out of thousands of toe tags that represent information about individuals who have died um, along the US-Mexico border through Arizona. The orange tags, they represent unidentified individuals, which is about 1,400 right now in Tucson alone. And the manila tags represent individuals who, who have been named. What we do with these exhibitions is basically we work with hosting partners. They call us up and they say, we, we're, we're interested in this. And we say, okay, we send them the kit with all of the toe tags, all of the information and the maps and the things that they need to build this. And then they, they mobilize their own communities and they get hundreds, if not thousands of people to sit down and to fill out toe tags and to construct these, um, these giant wall maps. They take these tags and they put them in the exact location of where those individuals were found. This is an exhibition that happened in the fall. This is at Mississippi State in Starksville, Mississippi. And in this video, what you're gonna see are students and faculty and staff filling out toe tags and then constructing this, um, this wall map of Arizona. Um, Jason, uh -huh. are you, um, uh, we're still on the first slide as far as I can oh. see, is that? Have you, is it not, you're not seeing, you're not seeing. We're still seeing your opening. Um, oh my God, really? I don't know why that is. Um, shoot. Oh yeah, now it's moving. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just showed like 15 slides. <laughs> yeah. um, let me just, uh, let me go back here then and. I'm not. I, I, I promise I won't start this talk over. Um, so, sorry. Here, you're seeing all this though. Is yeah, now it's coming to Okay. Yeah. Many apologies. Um, I've never had that happen. I'm not sure why that why it's doing that. No, I don't know. Um, okay. So, um, let's just start with this map then. So I've talked about you know these thousands of deaths that have that have happened. Um, you know, along the US-Mexico border. And this is what it looks like when you when you try to visualize it um, or when you map it out in, 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 in Google, Google Earth. And what I've been trying to do in, in, with recent work, um, exhibition work, is to raise awareness about this publicly through different, through different mechanisms. And so we've, um, we launched a, an exhibition in, in 2019, as I said, called Hostile Terrain 94, 
which involves the filling out of um, thousands of toe tags that represent individuals that have died while crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and we get we get folks in different locations who who organize their communities to to build these things to bring together hundreds, if not thousands, of volunteers, um, and then they construct these wall maps. So here is uh, a, a time lapse of the show from University of Missi from Mississippi State. And what you're seeing here, you know, it's students and staff. They are filling out tags on the ground. They um, have laid out the grid that represents the exact location of where those individuals were found, and and they are now mounting those tags in the exact location of of where those um, those remains were found. And this is a process that can take weeks. Some you know some exhibitions are that are going on. They do it over the course of many months. Um, we've we've done it in a variety of different contexts. There's there's been about fifty shows that have happened so far, and there's probably about twenty five shows that are happening um, at the moment. Um, and re the, really, the idea is is relatively simple. I wanted to take this two dimensional map and and make it into something that was living and breathing and three dimensional that represented. Um, or help to connect to an audience in a better way, the, the just the, the gravity of this of, of this amount of loss of life. And, and I think something really special happens when we ask volunteers to come to a, a space to sit down and to write out the names of the dead. Um, and for me, it becomes a way to memorialize these individuals, to remember this loss of life, but also as a way for, for folks to connect with this in a different kind of way. Um, you know, there's just something more personal, I think, about about your own handwriting and your own, you know, and, and contributing and collaborating with this as opposed to going to an exhibition and just seeing this already already kind of built. Um, we launched this in 2019 through a series of prototypes. Um, we predict now that um, probably by the end of by the end of this year, um, we'll probably get to um, about 120 shows. Um, we're, these shows are probably not going to go in, into 2024 at least. Um, we're getting constant requests for new shows, um, but you know the, the idea is that anybody can host this that wants to. It's relatively simple to simple to install. It's it's relatively cheap to to host, um, and we've done it around the globe. We've done numerous shows in Europe. We've got shows coming up in Africa and Asia, um, and then we will launch um, our Latin American shows starting in um, in the in the summer. And so if you're interested in that and getting involved, you can you can check out our website and learn more about um, how to potentially host Hostile Terrain 94. Like I said, we work with student groups, we work with church groups, universities, art galleries, anybody that that has a wall and is interested in this issue. Um, and I'll come back to that in, 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 towards the end. Um, OK, so I've given you some history about prevention through deterrence, unfortunately, with not not all of my interesting slides that would have illustrated that. But maybe you just in your in your mind, you can visualize the um, the desert. But now I'll give you some actual photos of the desert. Um, these are uh, two men that I got to know many years ago that I write about and who I um, who I call Memo and Lucho. These were these were people who were getting ready to cross the border uh, into the United States through the Sonora Desert. And on their last border crossing attempt, I gave them disposable cameras and had them document their experiences um, so that I could understand and I could see it and then so that they could also share their story with, with others. Memo and Lucho would tell you if you were crossing the Sonora Desert and you wanted, to, you wanted to get to the United States, you typically begin in a place called Altar, which is in northern Mexico. Altar is a, is a trucking town that, um, that focuses on you know produce and other things that are coming through as well as um, a lot of drug smuggling and a lot of human smuggling so many migrants show up in altar to meet up with a smuggler uh, it, so much so to the point that the local baseball team they're called the coyotes of altar and in spanish coyote is a, a euphemism for human smuggler so many of these folks they just know where to go they get to altar they meet up with their guide that guide puts them into a van and will drive them to the u.s mexico border where they will then try to walk across the desert um, and, and try to get to a place like Tucson, which is way up here, the top of top of the map, about about 70 miles uh, north of the Mexican town of Nogales. But before people do, um, do that, they've got to get lots of equipment. So water bottles, um, hiking boots, backpacks, whatever things that they can afford, which is not much, um, and whatever they can stuff into a backpack to get them through the desert, which is also not much. So you could imagine a few cans of food, maybe some first aid equipment, um, extra pair of socks, uh, and, um, you know, some extra clothing and maybe three, four gallons of water. You can never carry enough water to get across this environment, especially in the summer. I mean, it's a brutal, brutal heat where many, many people die from, from lack of water, from hyperthermia, from exposure, but also from having to deal with, you know, a, a natural environment that has, where everything has evolved to, to poke, 
scratch, inject you with venom. You know, more rattlesnakes in, than anywhere in the Western Hemisphere is found in the Sonora Desert. Um, you know, incredibly treacherous terrain that people have to get across. Migrants are crossing the desert um, at night with no compass, with no map, with no flashlight. Um, they're oftentimes wearing things like cheap sneakers. So there, there are many things that are working against them to get across this um, this, this very difficult landscape. And, you know, when they do this, um, it kills a lot of people. Like I said, millions of people have gone through this and have been brutalized by it physically. And, and thousands of people have died and disappeared during the process. And, um, you know, we've done, we've done lots of um, forensic work, which I'm not gonna get um, too into about how quickly a body can decompose in this environment, but it's, you know, sometimes under a week. Um, it's clear that migrants are dying in a lot of places where nobody is looking for them, uh, where there's lots of things uh, working against the, the counting and identification of, um, of migrant bodies. And I just wanna return real quick to a map to, to, to kind of drive this point home. So if we come back to this, this death map here in, in Arizona, you'll see to the left of the screen, there's just a big open area where there's no red dots. And the implication is that nobody dies over there. Um, but what I would point out is that that's a federal uh, bombing range. And so um, volunteers who go out in the desert looking for, for, for migrants and for migrant remains um, or hikers, hunters, and other folks who oftentimes are the ones who find migrant bodies don't have access to that area. So there are big parts of this of this border where we think lots of people are dying and just, but unfortunately there's been, um, there, there's been little um, ability for folks to get in there to actually find those, um, uh, those remains. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the, the Southern United States, especially in Southern Arizona, is a, you know, it's a killing field uh, where thousands of, of bodies have likely gone unrecovered and probably will, will never be recovered because they're destroyed so quickly. Um, and so for the last part of, of you know, of, of this talk, I want to just focus kind of on, on, on a couple of stories about those individuals that don't make it. Um, and... It, this has been going on for su for such a long time, and I think it's um, you, you know when I began this work in two thousand nine, um, I was pretty shocked the first time I came across uh, human remains in the desert. Um, and the first time that happened, they were skeletonized human remains. You know, it was a uh, we were out in the desert looking for um, uh, for an individual that that someone I knew had uh, he had found part of a skeleton, and so we'd gone back out to look for this person's skull and a few uh, and other elements that we thought would be helpful for identification. Um, we ended up not finding the skull, but what we ended up finding was, um, you know, a couple of teeth and, uh, you know, a complete human arm, com completely stripped of flesh, but really, but just sticking out of a, a pair of rocks, um, in, in the desert. And it was one of the most bizarre and troubling things that I, that I had ever seen, you know, you don't expect to go out in, into nature and just see a human being who's been ripped apart and just, and just out there, um, exposed to the elements. But that in, in fact was, was what I was, um, uh, privy to qu quite early in this project. And as the project sort of developed, we, we had more and more, you know, in, in encounters with, um, with, with death, but you know what, um, but what I want to talk about today really is uh, is is one that that really stuck with me and that I think has really shaped a lot of my work subsequently um, and my interest in this um, in the subject matter. And so I'm going to tell a couple of a couple of stories here. The eight of us stand around her in silent awe, and it's obvious that not everybody in the group that I'm with this, this group of students, not everybody's seen a corpse before because somebody asks me if she's really dead. She's lying face down in the dirt, and it appears that she's perished while attempting to get up a hill. To get to this point in the desert, she's easily walked over 40 miles. Rigor mortis has set in, and her fingers have started to curl. Her ankles are swollen to the point that it looks like her shoes are about to pop off. The back of her pants are stained with excrement and bubbling with copper-colored fluids that have been expelled from her body upon death. She's been dead only a few days and is in what forensic anthropologists would term early decomposition. What that means is gray to green discoloration of skin, some relatively fresh, flesh relatively fresh, but bloating, um, brown to black discoloration of arms and legs. But these descriptions that you get from these textbooks, they don't do justice to what bodies left out in the desert look like, smell like, or sound like. Nothing does. Against the quiet backdrop of the desert, you can, you can hear the buzzing of flies laying eggs on her. 
There's also the steady hissing of intestinal gases that are escaping from her bloated and distended stomach. It sounds like a slow leaking tire. After several days in the sweltering uh, desert heat, her body has begun to change. Her skin has started to blacken and mummify, and the bloating is starting to obscure some of her physical features. But while parts of her are starting to transform into unfamiliar shapes and colors, her striking jet black hair and the ponytail holder wrapped around her right wrist, these things hint at the person that she once was. I ask a student that I'm with to go get a blanket, and we cover her up. It makes those of us still alive feel better. High above us, turkey vultures are circling her corpse. And at this point, um, you know, we had already been doing forensic experiments using, um, using pigs as, as proxies for human bodies in the desert to understand how quickly um, um, uh, organisms of that size, mammals of that size decompose. And what we were seeing prior to this, to this moment was you could have 35 vultures at one time feeding on an animal and completely devouring and destroying a body within a matter of days. And so it's troubling that we find this individual and, and then there are also turkey vultures there. I count at least four of them circling above and I marvel at how quickly they've gotten to the scene. I try to ignore them and write down some, some notes because I don't know what to do with myself. I'm, I'm trying to play the role of the anthropologist, but it's difficult. And, and I, I'm, I'm trying to be the adult in the group because I'm the oldest person I'm supposed to be in charge. And I don't really know what to do with this encounter with this person who was who's only been dead a few days. But I start taking notes. She's got no personal possessions with her um, other than a, a bottle of electrolyte fluids. Um, she's laying face down on the ground. Uh, we take notes. I take some pictures. I call the police and we, we go and sit under that tree and wait for the cops to show up. So it's me and a group of students who sit there. And the silence among us is so tense. Um, but occasionally it's broken when, when a breeze comes through and rustles the branches of that tree. Out of the blue, someone in the group starts crying uncontrollably and, uh, and has to be consoled immediately. Someone else is so angry that she has to walk off into the distance to be alone. And those vultures just keep circling overhead. These birds are simultaneously implicated in this complex human drama, but they're also oblivious to it. I mean, all these birds know is that we've interrupted their lunch plans. But I want to say something to this group of students that I'm with because I feel like that's my job as a, as a professor, as the person leading this team, to try to help people make sense of this and maybe to try to make this death seem peaceful or dignified. But it's one of the dumbest ideas I've ever had because there's nothing you can say in this moment that does not sound contrived. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to know what to say other than to just to, to maybe want to scream. And it's a hard moment to, you know, to we sit there and we watch this body we wait for the cops. It feels very undignified that this person has to die out here alone in the desert. Um, but maybe that's the point. You know, I think sometimes this is what this is what prevention through deterrence looks like. This is what this policy is intended to do: to push people out into the desert, to stop them, um, and oftentimes to kill them. And this is an uncomfortable thing. But I think in, for for all of us, we need to understand that this is what the reality looks like right now in, in places like the unit, the Sonora Desert of Arizona, but also places like the Darien Gap in um, um, in southern Panama, in the in the Sahara Desert, in the Mediterranean. Right, there were bodies decomposing in all of these places, the bodies of migrants, and there aren't enough um, witnesses, and there's not enough outrage about this. Um, and I want to point out to my you know to my American fellow citizens is that. Um, you know, we don't need to go to third world countries to get full frontal views of the dead and dying, like Susan Sontag has argued. We can go to our own backyard and we can see bodies on the ground um, decomposing. The dead live here and we just tend to ignore them. Sitting there on that dusty afternoon with those students um, waiting for the police to show up, which takes hours and hours, I finally blurt out, at least we got to her before the vultures did. And that person that we found her name was Carmita Maricela Zaguipuya. She was a 31-year-old mother of three from Cuenca, Ecuador, who left her family um, her, and her three children to try to make it to the United States so that she could better provide for them. She was abandoned by her smuggler after she became ill and was unable to continue walking. And Maricela likely died from a combination of hyperthermia and a pre-existing medical condition, uh, kidney condition. But one of the things that Maricela said to her family right before she left Ecuador was, quote, my kids are dying of hunger here. My kids are suffering. 
Whatever my destiny is, I must go. After finding Maricela's body, I made contact with her family in Ecuador and in New York. And one of the biggest themes of the conversations that we had um, revolved around the condition that her body was in when we found it. The family was very, very concerned that she had been um, um, eaten by animals. And so, um, you know, I went to visit the family. This is her, her sister-in-law and best friend, um, Christina. And one of the reasons that they were so concerned about, about the, the condition of her body was because um, when they received her coffin, you know, she'd been in the desert for six or seven days. And then she was in cold storage in Arizona for almost a month, unembalmed. And so um, the, she had to be shipped back to Ecuador um, in a closed casket. And the medical examiner said to the family, please do not open this coffin. And so Christina says to me, they said not to open the coffin, but we'd been planning to change her clothes when she got here for the funeral. We wanted her to look good for the funeral. We also wanted to be able to say goodbye to her. The children wanted to say goodbye to her. They said not to open the coffin, but we did anyway. And so what happened when they opened the coffin is the body was in a horrible state of condition. Um, and also what the medical examiner didn't want to tell the family was that they had to remove her hands with a bandsaw so that they could rehydrate her, her fingers to, to fingerprint them, um, which is one of the techniques that they've, they've actually developed a technique for fingerprinting bodies in Arizona because they've had to deal with so many desiccated corpses that now there's a whole new standard way of, of taking um, fingerprints, but it does re involve removing these, removing the hands. And so, of course, the, when the family got the coffin, everybody wanted to, to see Maricela. They wanted to confirm that it was her. Um, but Christina says that we opened the box and it was a mess. It didn't look like her. Uh, it was te it was terrible. She said the children were screaming. They wanted to see their mother and uh, to say goodbye. And the thing that they saw that was in that box was not their mother, um, but but will stick with them for the rest of their lives. And you know, Christina, they really wanted me to, to bring photographs of the body, so I did. I brought pictures that we had taken um, uh, to confirm that 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 it in fact wasn't animals that had gotten to her, but it was just the fact that she had been she had not been embalmed. Um, but regardless, you know, to see your loved one in that state of condition, I think was a, a, a incredibly traumatizing event for everyone involved, especially for the, the children. Um, but Christina says to me, you know, we don't believe that it's her because of the way she looked. But if it is her, we thank God because it's a miracle that we have her back. She says she's only half complete, but at least she came back. And if that is her, then it does help us to move forward. Uh, the children have a grave that they can go visit. Um, you know, there's a place that they can go um, uh, to speak to their mother. Uh, but she says, you know, it was it was just incredibly difficult to see her in this form. But we're lucky at least that we got we got something back. And you know, in a lot of ways, I think she's correct um, because there are a lot of families that have not gotten um a body back you know at colibri right now we're we're working on over 3300 open missing persons reports um trying to find matches um with the 1300 un unidentified bodies that are currently sitting in um, the medical examiner's office and so there are a lot of families that don't have a, a coffin to bury that don't have a grave to go visit and and i think perhaps that 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 element of prevention through deterrence, the fact that it, it makes these bodies disappear is one of the most troubling aspects of this whole thing. You know, all of these orange toe tags representing the unidentified um, individuals really sticks with me and, 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 and troubles me in ways that I, that, um, that I oftentimes have a hard time articulating. And this is because of um, my own kind of firsthand experience with seeing how families deal with, with the disappearance of a loved one. Clinical psychologist Pauline Boss, she's got a, a, a phrase that she is coined called ambiguous loss. And it really just refers to um, when, when a family member disappears and you don't know if they're dead or alive, people are stuck in this perpetual state of mourning. They don't know, um, you know, they're holding out hope that maybe that individual is still alive. Maybe they have amnesia. Maybe they've been kidnapped. Um, there's always this possibility that they could come back, even if it's been many, many years. You know, people who, are, who have been kidnapped, who have been murdered, we, we see this in a variety of different um, kinds of contexts. And Pauline Boss argues that it's the not knowing what has happened to these individuals that it really is crippling for these families. It, it paralyzes them and puts them into this 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 frozen state of grief where they cannot begin to move forward and to and to have and to even begin the process of closure because they're never quite sure if if the person that they're mourning is um is in fact dead and after after we found maricela's body and that whole story kind of unfolded i really thought that that was going to be the worst thing that i would ever that i was ever going to see um in arizona and of course 
I think things can always get get worse. Um, it was about a year after um, after we found Maricela's body. I was sitting in uh, in the in the airport in Tucson, getting ready to come home after a summer of field work, when I got a text message from uh, from Christina saying, basically, we've got a family member who's disappeared. Can you come and help us find this individual? And so I got involved in this in this missing persons case with this family to try to figure out where this family member went missing, if we could go back in the desert and try to find them um, and perhaps reunite them with their families. And so I, I went to New York and started interviewing people who had been with this with this person who was missing. And this is from one interview I did with a 13 year old kid that I call Felipe. And he says to me, we were in the desert for five days and the water ran out. And my cousin Jose, he kept stopping to sit down and drink water. He was sick and his feet were hurting and he just, he couldn't keep going. Finally, at about six o'clock in the morning, he fell down on the ground and just and couldn't get up. So the, the smuggler came over and started kicking him and saying, you need to get up or I'm gonna beat you. But my cousin Jose couldn't go on any farther. He was dazed and, and, and sick. He said to leave him behind. So we gave him what little water we had left. We got him situated underneath a tree and we went to get help. And they were picked up by immigration um, agents just a couple of days later. The relative that they um, that they left behind was a 15-year-old kid named Jose Maria Tacuri. Um, and when I started doing interviews with Jose's dad um, about where his son was and, and where, where, we, where we think he could have ended up, one of the things that his dad also really wanted to talk about was just why his son was in the desert. Why would someone risk their child's life. Um, you know, he really wanted me to understand what, what, what had happened. Um, and so this is what, this is what, this is what he says to me. When I was in Ecuador in Cuenca, my son, Jose was my right hand. He was always with me. We were inseparable, but when I came to this country, he became a rebellious child. I would call my son and I would ask him, why have you changed? Cause Jose was living with an elderly grandmother. He was out partying at all, all, all times of the night, largely, you know, being unsuper, uh, acting like a wild, unsupervised teenager. And so his parents were becoming concerned. And so they asked him, why have you changed? And Jose's response to his dad was, no, Poppy, I haven't changed. It's your fault. You left me. We were like brothers. You were my everything and you left me. It's your fault that I'm like this, he says. And his dad responds, well, I didn't come to New York because I wanted to. I came here because I wanted to get ahead because in Ecuador, I can't give you the things that you need. I can't provide for you or your family or your, your, your siblings. And Jose has, has a, um, a, a disabled um, sister. Um, so his dad says, I left when he was 10 years old to provide for him, but he didn't understand those things at the time. He just thought that we had, that we had abandoned him and, and he had changed from being such a good kid. But then all he would say to us was that if he could come to New York, that things would be better. But I said, you have everything in, in Ecuador. You finally have a nice house to live in. You've got new clothes. You've got internet in your house. But Jose would say to his parents that, that he just felt empty inside, that he would go home and his parents wouldn't be there. And that the only thing that would help to fill the emptiness that he felt inside of himself was to be reunited with his parents. So they decided after five years of being away from their son that they would let him come um, to the United States. And so they sent for him. And his dad says, the last time I spoke to my son, he said to me, dad, I want to tell you something, but I'll do it when we're, when we're face to face. And his dad says, but no, if it's, if it's bothering you right now, just, just tell me just there's nothing you can't tell me right now. And Jose says, we'll do it face to face, like father and son. Cause it had been five years since, um, they'd, they'd seen each other face to face five years since they'd hugged each other five years since, since Jose's dad had kissed him, had done any of those things that just parents need to do to their children to let them know that they care and they, that they love them. And so Jose says, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it when I see you in person. And his dad tells me, but he never did get to tell me what that was. But I guess he had met a girl in Ecuador and they'd gone out for about six months and they were together before he left and she had gotten pregnant. And he wanted to know, I guess, if I would help him and his daughter. Three months after Jose disappeared in the Sonora Desert of Arizona, um, his daughter, Maria Jose was born and his dad says, you know, that's one of my biggest regrets to this day that I was never able to tell my son that I was going to support him and his daughter, that I was going to be able to, 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 to take care of them. And, you know, 
I'm, I'm when, when this happened, you know, at the time, I had a child at the time. I had a, I had a young child when I, when, when I had this conversation and over the years, I think that this conversation for me has taken on more and more weight. I mean, and, and, and kind of one of the reasons that, that, you know, we've, I've taken on the work with the Colibri Center for Human Rights is that, um, I think as I've grown as a person, as I've worked with the, with families of the missing, um, it, it's number one, I think if I ever need to put myself into a very dark place, I need to think about the worst things that could ever happen to me. They're not things that happen to me. They're things that happen to my own children. Um, and, and I sort of understood that on a basic level when I, when I, when I first interacted with Jose's parents and, and I've definitely come to understand it more and more as I've gotten older, as my, as my children have gotten older, because this particular day sitting with, with, with Jose's dad, he, he gave me this look that, that I've never been able to shake. And it's just this look of utter despair, this tortured look of like, I, I, I can't imagine a more broken kind of person, like the, the, the feeling that one must have to lose a child and not know what has happened to them. Um, he gives me this look and then he says to me, he says, We're, I'm just trying to find anything that might help me understand what has happened to my son. He says, there's nothing that I can do to get the joy back until, uh, until we know what has happened to him. Just to know something about my son, that's all that I want, he says. But then he says, I can't go down to the border and look for my own, my own child. To lose him like this and not know what is happening, he's like, you feel helpless. He's like, it, it, it's going to make us cry for the rest of our lives. He says, every day that passes, we feel more and more out of control. And it feels like I'm losing some kind of a battle. But then he looks at me too and he says, I try to wake up though every day with energy and to be positive and to say, today we're going to find him, today we're going to find him. But then he says, it's difficult to live like this, these ups and downs of com complete despair and then trying to find some hope so that you can get up in the morning and face the day. But he says, it's really difficult to live like this, to know nothing. And then he just says, all I can hope is that someday I'll be reunited with Jose in one form or another. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. That was a compelling and powerful talk. It, um, yeah, it's really helped me to understand the um, scale and the intensity of the violence that these migrants are experiencing, but you've also helped bring forward the, some of the humanity of those people. And that, that is um, 